ready to hear what we have to say. My name is Paul Vandenberg. I'm an economist here at the ADB. Um, sometimes I work on social protection. Um, sometimes I don't. Um, but anyways, I've been asked to moderate this session today. We have a very interesting um, session today, um, and it's mostly because we have um, four very good speakers uh, who are very knowledgeable about social protection and inflation. Three of them are here today. One of them will present to you online, and um, and and that will be quite interesting. We we have someone from the OECD, we have someone who works with the World Bank, and then we have country representatives from Thailand and Indonesia who will be telling you about programs in their countries and how these programs help people with social protection and in some cases how they help to guard against the problems of inflation. Uh, so it should be a good session today. We're going to have two speakers first, then we're going to break for a Q&A, okay? And then we're going to have the, the next two speakers. So um, if you have questions for the first two speakers, wait till the end of the second speaker. And then, and then we'll go into the other two speakers. And, and please don't, don't hesitate to ask a question or even give a comment. We have some microphones up there that can help you. Okay? Um, I think that's all from my side. Uh, I think I'm going to call up our first speaker. We have with us from Paris, Herwig Imrevol. He's a senior economist and the head of the employment-related social policies. Um, in the director of em Directorate of Employment, Labor, and Social, Social Affairs, and he's with the OECD. So if you could welcome Herwig uh, to make his presentation. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Paul. Uh, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to uh, co-sponsor this, uh, this session. Um, the OECD was mentioned a few times uh, in the morning. Some of you may know uh, the organization. Uh, we don't finance um, social uh, protection or any projects, uh, in, in fact. But uh, we do a lot of uh, um, experience exchange uh, and uh, facilitating learning uh, across countries. And we help countries also uh, implement uh, reforms uh, when they are going uh, about that. So uh, I'm very happy to uh, be learning uh, here, uh, also from, uh, from, from the different uh, countries, um, and uh, be, uh, be able to, to share some experiences of OECD countries. OECD countries are uh, mostly high-income countries, uh, but not only. We also work with, uh, with middle-income uh, countries, but the, the experience is, is very diverse. The... Um, the uh, the theme of the of the conference, of course, is uh, social protection in the in a changing world, and a changing world uh, it is. Um, so OECD and high income countries have experienced uh, have had their share of different uh, shocks uh, and crises over the you know, recent decades. Um, but uh, before 2022, they had little to no experience uh, with dealing with high uh, inflation and the implications of uh, soaring uh, living costs for, for households um, and uh, for, uh, with support uh, policies. So in this, this context, the cost of living crisis raises uh, a number of uh, questions that I will be uh, talking about. First, how governments can leverage uh, existing social protection uh, policies in times of high inflation. Secondly, how can social protection be be made more effective uh, in order to, to work better uh, in this, uh, in this uh, difficult economic context, uh, and what can be done to, to scale up uh, different support measures. So we'll try to give an overview of policy challenges and responses in, uh, in OECD countries, and hopefully some of them will be of interest uh, in the context of your countries um, as well. Next slide, please. So just to, to show you uh, the context in terms of inflation, um, you see uh, that headline inflation uh, on the left here has fallen uh, recently, in recent months, um, and that was due to um, a reversal of the soaring energy uh, prices, so they have uh, come down. Um, and you see that for, um, for high income and for uh, emerging market uh, economies. Um, and I think the, the, the levels are comparable to inflation that uh, has been seen also in the Asia and uh, Pacific region. So the OECD definitely was not uh, immune from, from these uh, trends. 
We also see that actually, even though energy costs have come down, food and uh, service prices, uh, including for, importantly for necessities such as housing, have continued to rise rapidly and therefore what's often called core inflation, which excludes things like uh, food and energy, remains uh, stubbornly high. And core inflation is now actually dominated by, the, by prices for services um, because they tend to be more dependent on labor costs and therefore they're less variable uh, than good price uh, inflation. And this brings me to the important role, in fact, of labor markets uh, and wages when thinking about uh, social policy responses. So one aspect of that is shown here. Labor markets are, of course, uh, very important for understanding how the cost of living crisis, uh, next slide, please, how the cost of living crisis translates into challenges for, for social protection. Um, what we see here is uh, wages. So as inflation reached levels, uh, the levels not seen in uh, decades in, in many countries, the real hourly wages have actually fallen uh, initially uh, and often quite substantially. Uh, in virtually uh, all industries and all uh, OECD uh, countries. So you see nominal uh, increases, but in real terms, uh, losses in, uh, in, in many countries uh, initially. And the loss of, uh, of, uh, of purchasing power is, of course, uh, um, particularly challenging for, for workers uh, in low-income households uh, who have little leeway of uh, dealing with, with higher prices. Um, also through uh, savings which they don't have or borrowing which they, which they can't uh, access. Um, and because a higher proportion of their, uh, their spending goes to necessities such as energy and food. Next slide, please. And so it's interesting to look uh, at different parts of uh, the labor market and the, the low wage uh, sector in particularly. What we see here is uh, negotiated uh, pay. Um, and that is one key driver of, uh, of wage developments. Um, so we see that collective bargaining indeed can play an important uh, role um, in, uh, in wage development. They can also act as a lighthouse for wage developments so for groups who are not covered by, by collective bargaining. Um, but that has actually weakened across uh, OECD countries in, in recent decades. So fewer workers are, uh, are covered. Um, and uh, we see that uh, even in countries uh, such as some Nordics or Central European countries where uh, a lot of uh, people are covered by collective uh, bargaining. Um, we see that uh, real wages have, have plummeted uh, initially, partly because uh, wage adjustments were delayed, uh, partly because uh, social partners are looked uh, towards to, uh, to actually facilitate stabilization and uh, avoid a, a wage uh, price uh, spiral. Now we can expect faster growth uh, in negotiated wages in the, in the coming uh, quarters, and we see that already in uh, wage negotiations and uh, reports uh, in the media. But actually, right now, projections are for uh, aggregate wage to, to, to lag behind uh, prices and to keep lagging behind. So challenges also for social policies. Next slide, please. Particularly for low-wage workers, uh, and it's interesting to look also at the impact of uh, minimum wages, of statutory minima. Um, and they have become more important uh, across OECD countries. So if we look at uh, the 1990s, for instance, I think about only half of OECD countries had a statutory minimum uh, in place. Now it's more than uh, three quarters of countries and also um, the, the level of minima relative to average or median wages has gone up uh, quite a bit from under 50% to, uh, to, to 55%, I think, uh, across, across the OECD before the cost of living crisis. Uh, and more recently, and you see this here in the slide, between December uh, 2020 uh, and, uh, and May 2023, that's the most recent data that, that we had, uh, nominal statutory wages actually uh, increased quite a bit, 29% uh, on average. Um, and this has allowed minima, minimum wages to, to keep pace uh, with inflation largely. But we also see that uh, during periods in between, when inflation was really high, um, minimum wages often struggled to keep pace because they're not sufficiently quickly uh, adjusted, uh, or there's other reasons why they, why, they, why they weren't adjusted if labor markets were, uh, were weak. Um, so uh, in most OECD countries, in fact, uh, increases in the minimum wage are, in fact, the result of discretionary uh, policy um, decisions 
but uh, there's also a couple of countries, there's are interesting uh, examples in, uh, in a context like this where statutory minima are automatically indexed. I think uh, six countries fall into that uh, category. So this quick uh, review, next slide please, of uh, wage developments um, indicates that uh, experiences vary a lot across countries as, as you would uh, expect, but also a lot of uh, different uh, populations group, groups and a different uh, different points of the cost of uh, living crisis. And, and recent findings also consistently show that it, it's, it's always the, the most disadvantaged households who suffer most from the cost of living crisis also in the, in the OECD for the reasons that I, that I mentioned. So in principle, this of course suggests a very important role of uh, targeting support to these groups. You want it to be responsive, you want it to arrive at the right time, but you don't want it to go to everybody. Um, you want uh, specifically to focus on uh, groups who are uh, most disadvantaged and affected by price increases. So has this actually happened? Well, here we see that, that's, that, that it hasn't. So uh, um, we see a breakdown here of, um, um, of different uh, support um, measures that uh, were, were put in place uh, based on a sort of a monitoring exercise that we do together with our uh, member countries. And you see a very large um, component, a very large share of the sizable support me measures were done in the form of price uh, support measures, so to subsidize uh, prices basically or, re or regulate them. Um, and uh, many of them, most of them, the large majority of them were untargeted. That's partly because it's very difficult to target uh, price measures. Income support measures were also important, but they were much smaller. Um, and the larger share of them have uh, been targeted. Uh, and also if you compare 2022 and 2023, a larger share of them have become uh, targeted uh, over time. Uh, and so the question is, what can we learn from some of these uh, uh, experiences? How have countries actually uh, made their income support, uh, engaged their income support for uh, during this period, and how have they uh, adjusted income support measures? Next slide, please. So there's different approaches, and that depends a little bit on the starting point of uh, the social uh, protection system, so how many people are covered, what the structure is of the social benefits that are in place. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so a first priority is arguably linking uh, is linking existing benefits to prices. So in other words, to make sure that existing benefit provisions continue to operate uh, as intended. So that requires relatively frequent uh, adjustments and adjustments that actually reflect the living conditions of uh, benefit claimants. Um, now, this is largely a, a technical uh, sort of challenge, but in, 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 it may be surprising to see that actually relatively few countries have uh, a, uh, a, a very uh, a systematic adjustment uh, system uh, in place. So if we look at assistance benefits for which um, these ad adjustments are arguably the most uh, important because insurance benefits to some extent respond automatically when wages change, uh, we can see many examples such as the one that I see, uh, show here for the US where um, the net income of a benefit recipient, if you just calculated for different years, um, does not at all keep pace with, uh, with prices. There are uh, some adjustments over longer, if you look at a sufficiently long period, but they happen irregularly, uh, and in between there can be large losses uh, in purchasing uh, power. And you see that also, next slide please, for uh, a, si a similar picture for, uh, for other countries here. There are uh, there are several countries, and that's interesting also when we look at, next slide please, when we look at um, how countries actually undertake these adjustments, there are several countries that do not only look at average prices, but they try to look at um, the prices of the consumption baskets that are most typical for benefit uh, recipients. Um, so for instance, that's the case in some European countries, in Estonia, Germany, Lithuania, um, some Nordic countries such as Sweden, um, where these consumption needs are taken into account uh, at certain intervals um, in order to uh, make sure that the, the adjustments are realistic and actually help those they are, they are supposed to help. Next slide, please. So that's the first priority, is to basically adjust existing benefits, but 
benefits don't reach everybody. Um, we, and we've seen this already in the, uh, in the morning uh, session, and we've heard this. Um, so for some uh, low-income groups, actually, existing benefits are, are very difficult uh, to access. Um, there's different ways of looking at that. Uh, in the graph here, you see, for instance, the share of uh, benefit spending for, for working age people that goes to, that goes to uh, the bottom income group. And um, we see huge differences uh, across countries with, with large shares on the left. Um, we're targeting works um, uh, in that sense uh, and relatively small shares uh, at the, uh, on, on the right. And so where these accessibility gaps uh, exist, the question is how do we to address them and how to address them in the context of a, uh, of a crisis situation. And arguably tackling these uh, structural reasons for poor accessibility uh, or take up is, is actually very difficult in the midst of, uh, of, of a crisis. So uh, uh, temporary ad hoc uh, assistance may then be uh, called upon and may be needed. Uh, and that's where we get into this difficult trade-off of is it, is it, is it worth, uh, is it needed to, um, to come up with ad, ho ad hoc programs or does this create some sort of future problems for, um, for in terms of complexity, uh, in, ter in terms of in inertia for the overall social protection system and actually make it less uh, transparent. And there are cases also in um, actually countries that have very mature social protection system, such as Germany, where there were lots of different programs put in place for lots of different groups, up to 30 programs, for instance. Um, and so it's, it's very difficult for the people concerned to, um, to, to, to keep track of that, but also for the policymakers. So there can be situations where targeting does not work as intended, where some people may not receive, receive, receive anything or where others may be overcompensated uh, for inflation. And that has actually... Um, gotten a lot of uh, media um, attention in, uh, in uh, Germany and other countries. So let me uh, skip a f two slides, actually. So can you move forward one more, please? Um, because I'm, uh, I only have uh, one minute left. So let me try and um, see what the, what, what the common threads uh, I can weave through uh, this uh, different uh, experience that I, that I talked about. So helping households during a cost of living crisis is of course key for social welfare reasons and for uh, stemming a rise in, uh, in poverty and, and destitution. But in addition, and that's especially important uh, during this period, um, there's an important link with the green transition, uh, the net zero agenda, the just transition. Because higher prices for, for carbon intensive uh, products are indeed a, a key pillar of national and international commitments towards, uh, towards net zero. Um, and yet a period of rapidly escalating energy prices, uh, sometimes combined with, uh, with a public perception of, uh, of inadequate support, can arguably risk a backlash and derail um, the, 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 the green transition at a, at a critical time. So that's why uh, looking at support measures is particularly important now. Um, I talked about how, uh, it's, uh, how, how it's better to, to adjust uh, existing benefits when, they're, when coverage is very good, but what to do um, when, uh, when there are gaps. Um, there are some interesting uh, ideas for um, actually making price support measures um, more targeted. I, I think that's easier to do for, uh, for some uh, types of goods, such as energy, where you have one uh, provider in the long term where you can introduce things like social uh, tariffs. It's much harder to do for, for food and, uh, and, and other necessities. But I think some interesting experiences from countries also show that um, the price support um, can be uh, made less costly uh, when, when it is needed. Um, for instance, by basing uh, support not on current consumption, but on, the, on last year's consumption. So Germany did that, for instance, in order to not change the marginal uh, prices and the incentives that people see. So households still have an incentive to, to save uh, energy because they get a fixed lump sum. Uh, they don't get everything uh, re recompensated in terms of the higher prices. Uh, it's only it's based on what they consumed last time. But that, of course, creates big uh, challenges for data uh, processing. So you need proper data processing and pro data linkages uh, in place uh, for this to work. I think a general uh, in, um, 
a general uh, priority right now, and that's the last point I will make, uh, Paul, <laughs> is that um, uh, it's important to also think about exit strategy from uh, out of support measures that are uh, very costly. Um, and uh, if we think of uh, price support measures, um, I think uh, a key point is that they are more e they're easier to, un to, to unwind when you have um, effective social uh, protection in place and when this can also be uh, communicated to claimants and recipients. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you. He's a bit taller than I have. I have to adjust my microphone. Thank you, Herrick. That was really interesting. And, and, you know, it's interesting because we get a look at the OECD. You know, we've got a couple of economies in Asia which are OECD, but most of them are in Europe and other places. And I, and I think the interesting thing you get from your uh, presentation is, uh, you know, we always think of the OECD having very good social protection policies, and that probably is the case. But it was interesting that you, you know, it, it's not a set thing, right? You still have to deal with problems. You st you're still trying to deal with changes and so on. It's, it's never a, a thing that you can get perfectly right. And I think that's a, an interesting lesson. Uh, I thought it was really interesting where you said, you know, sometimes, you know, there, there's a crisis. They put too many programs in place, you know, and they have to figure out, rationalize them and so on. It, it, it'd be nice if we had too many programs in some Asian countries, but anyways, an interesting uh, perspective on that. Okay, we're going to turn to our next speaker now, and she's online, uh, and I hope we'll be able to um, flash her on the big screen. Um, this is uh, Georgia Valeri Valeriani. Are you there, Georgia? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Yes. Good. Super. I'm just going to introduce you here. We can't see you Thanks. yet. I hope, we, I hope we're able to see your face at some point if our technicians... There she oh. is. You're on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I think you were on anyways. Uh, she's with the Social Protection and Global, uh, Jobs Global Practice at the World Bank. She works as a consultant at the World Bank. And uh, she's going to, um, you know, I think um, going beyond a little bit what Herwig said, she's going to get a, a little larger look at countries around the world from the very interesting work that they're doing there. So um, I'll let you uh, take it away from here. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. So I'll, I'll very quickly share my screen with you. Are you all able to see my screen? We are. Okay, perfect. So uh, I'm, first of all, I'm very glad to be here with you today. And I would like to walk you through our latest uh, report on global social protection responses uh, to inflation. Um, so our work tries to depict the current state of social protection policy in response to the latest uh, price shock crisis. So all the measures contained in our tracker pertain to the traditional social protection uh, categories ranging from social assistance, social insurance, labor market subsidies. But we also go a little bit beyond that and we look at measures pertaining to trade regulations and, and taxes. To give you a quick um, overview on the key trends and key messages, We've noticed that from the version one of our, of our report to today, the composition of responses changed. Um, subsidies do remain the predominant response, but its share uh, has decreased from about 79% to almost a third. On the other end, social assistance, which also remains the second best policy tool adopted, uh, has doubled its share as a response to about a third. And most of the measures that we record in our tracker uh, do come from high-income countries. Over uh, $1 trillion has been spent, uh, that is about 1.1% of global GDP has been, has been sp spent on social protection responses globally, and most of this expenditure goes to, to, to subsidies. Um, in terms of coverage, we found that almost 2 billion people were planned or were supposed to be covered, uh, that's about 25% of the global population. Whereas if we look at the actual values, um, actual figures, we find that only 303 million people 
uh, as been covered today. We also look into the generosity of transfer uh, sizes and benefits, and we find that about $7 per person per day are being devoted, um, are being received by individuals. That is about 27% of daily median income. Um, and we found that our measures, the programs put in place have an average duration of 7.3 months. Um, and most of them have also been extended uh, for about eight months. Narrowing down on uh, East Asia Pacific and South Asia, we found that the level of inflation um, is slightly lower compared to other regions in the world. We found that in South Asia, there is a predominance of subsidies, whereas in East Asia Pacific, uh, social assistance, it's more uh, predominant. The two regions together have jointly spent about $336 um, billion. And two countries, Cambodia and Japan, are featuring in the top 20 highest spending countries globally. We also found that there is a gap, there is a difference in coverage between the two regions. We found that over 900 million people uh, have been covered in South Asia versus 200 million people in uh, East Asia Pacific. And there is a difference also in terms of adequacy. So we found that in East Asia, about 16% uh, of the daily median income um, has, been, has been covered by the transfers compared to only 5% in South Asia. Another difference stands out in terms of duration of programs where in South Asia, it seems to be shorter compared to East Asia. So we also, let's take a look at, just very briefly at the responses that we found between the COVID-19 pandemic and the inflation crisis. So we produced about 16 versions, different living papers when we were tracking responses to COVID. And we, what we can see from this graph is that the, the increase, the evolution in measures was, is much steeper during the current price shock crisis compared to the pandemic, where it really kind of picked up only by the end of December 2020. So the response has been much, much faster in this sense. Um, if we also take a look across different key, um, key statistics, we see some contrasting results. So we see a higher spending, for instance, uh, when it comes to um, COVID-19 uh, crisis, it was much higher, almost threefold uh, that of inflation. Uh, we also see the number of cash measures being much higher during the pandemic. On the other hand, we also do observe some similarities. If we look, for instance, at the share of new cash transfer programs that, it, that have been specifically introduced uh, in response to the crisis, uh, we're, we have about 92% of new measures in both uh, crises. And of these, we do find that almost half of those uh, have been given in the form of one-off cash transfers. So to put inflation briefly into context, um, if we look at South Asia and East Asia Pacific, if we look at here, we have the minimum, average, maximum values. If we look at the averages, we do see that they're still below the global average, which is standing at 19.2%. Uh, Nonetheless, we do find quite a bit of a difference between South Asia and East Asia Pacific, where South Asia stands at 18% and East Asia only at 7.6. Um, okay, so here we have just briefly a top 10 highest food inflation countries uh, across the two regions. We see that Laos is standing uh, in the first position, followed by Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, and Mongolia. And this is based on latest inflation um, up until April 2023. So what is the response composition? Um, if we look at the global composition of responses on average, we, we see that there is almost an equal share of social assistance and, and subsidies standing at 31 and 33 percent each. And then if we take a closer look at South of East Asia Pacific, we do find that social assistance is more predominant at 47 percent, only followed by uh, subsidies at 36 percent. On the other hand, if we look at South Asia, we do find a predominance of subsidies, um, followed by actually trade related measures and tax measures. And, and social assistance only has a very uh, minor share at 30, 
I think it's also interesting to take a look at the composition of subsidies itself, because within subsidies, we have many different uh, types of, you know, pertaining to fee subsidies or agriculture and so on. And here we can see a different between, difference between the two regions. So we do see in East Asia Pacific a predominance of, uh, of fee subsidies, anything pertaining to energy bills, utilities, education, housing, transportation, uh, and that is followed by fuel subsidies. So a lot of support towards, uh, towards fuels. Um, in South Asia, on the other end, we do see a clear predominance of uh, food subsidies and fertilizers. And that also, it's, uh, it's a pattern that we do find if we look at the right hand side of the graph, it's also a pattern that we do find in, uh, in low income countries, um, followed by actually fertilizer and agriculture subsidies, whereas as opposed to, um, to high income countries where there's a vast majority of subsidies devoted to, to fee support, fee to support. Mm -hmm. So in terms of spending um, actual values, Again, we do see, we have data only for 42% of our sample, and we do see that there is, the majority of spending is devoted towards uh, subsidies, and then followed by social assistance. And we do see that this pattern is just, it's just a trend across the different regions. Uh, on the other hand, we do see social insurance and labor market programs receiving the, the least share of, of spending globally. Um, here on the left hand side, we have the top 15 countries um, uh, by spending as percentage of GDP. And in here, we do find Japan spending about 4% on average of its G uh, GDP to social protection policies. Whereas on the right hand side, we can see that for both South Asia and East Asia Pacific, the average spending as percentage of GDP is still lying a little bit below the, the global average spending. Now, in terms of coverage, uh, coverage is a bit tricky. Uh, if we look at East Asia Pacific, we have data available uh, for 12 programs versus only three in South Asia. So um, I would say that the, the great difference in terms of programs and variation in coverage is driving up a little bit this trend. So I would take this very, uh, these figures very carefully, but we do say that in East Asia Pacific, on average, 200 million people are supposed to be covered. That's about 8% of the population and over 900 million people in South Asia um, are, are planned or supposed to be covered. And this high figure is mainly driven by uh, a food grain subsidy cover uh, program in India. Um, that it's aiming to reach 800 million uh, people. So if we look at adequacy, then um, we do see that the global average as of today, the generosity of transfers uh, is about $7 per person per day. Um, and we do find both South Asia and East Asia um, presenting figures that are way below the global average. So we find about $0.2 per person per day in South Asia versus $4, approximately $4 per person per day in East Asia Pacific. Uh, we do have a very high uh, maximum value here in East Asia, and that is about $46 per person per day. And that is driven by a child allowance program actually in Hong Kong. Uh, which was massively increased in uh, 2023. Um, um, and then we have, yeah, on the, on the, on the left-hand side, we do have a, also a ranking of the top 10 programs uh, by adequacy. And we do see that actually in Europe and Central Asia, there are many programs that have been providing uh, a very massive, um, massive transfers and, and subsidy support we have the cleaner program standing in first position, followed by the child allowances uh, in the Netherlands. Now, in terms of uh, duration, um, in the very first versions of these tractors, we were able to understand a little bit how long were these programs were implemented uh, for. Uh, and we do see that in our regions of interest uh, in South Asia, programs tend to be slightly um, shorter, so about three months on average, versus in East Asia Pacific, where they tend to be a little bit, uh, to last a little bit longer in time. 
Again, this is based on available data in our sample, which comes from about 428 measures uh, across 143 countries. Um, in this current version of our report, we were also able to, to observe if any of these programs were actually extended in time. Uh, although the sample size is um, still quite small, so we had this extension data available only for 19% of it, we, we do observe that many of these subsidies programs especially uh, were prolonged in time. Um, so I would say we can uh, switch to some final um, implications and conclusions. We do find that social protection, it is at the center, as we said, of responding to inflation. In particular, we do see that the, it, it is, a, is a critical tool to continue providing people with access to food during high inflationary context. Uh, it is very important to notice that subsidies do remain the predominant uh, social protection tool. There is, there, there's been a pickup uh, in terms of social assistance programs, uh, a lot of trade regulations as well um, have been have been put in place uh, to counteract the, the price effect. But we do see that fee subsidies and fuel subsidies, especially um, in higher income countries, tend to be the most adopted policy, whereas more on the food subsidies and fertilizer subsidies are adopted in, uh, in lower um, income countries. In our regions of interest, East Asia and South Asia, we did observe some uh, big differences in terms of coverage, for instance, adequacy of, of benefits uh, and transfer sizes. But at the same time, we also did observe that in both, uh, in both regions, extensions tended to be uh, of similar length. And we also did observe that fee subsidies are, are a core component of the social protection um, agenda as well. So where, where to move forward? I think as we, as we all talk about it, adaptive social protection is at the core of our research at the moment. Um, and we are very much focusing our efforts on understanding how can we make social safety nets um, uh, more adaptable, and in this case, inflation proof. What are the current practices? Uh, are there indexation methodologies in place or not? So uh, a lot of our research at the moment is, is, is going in that direction. Uh, I think there is more and more of a multi-sectorial approach uh, when it comes to food subsidies, for instance, that, has, uh, that envisions an increased interaction as well and understanding of the supply chain perspective. And uh, finally, I would say that joint collaborations does the universal social protection um, effort um, that is conducted by the World Bank and the ILO uh, are other ways to, to move forward. So on these few points, I'll leave it here. Uh, and I thank you very much for your time today. Paul, I'll turn it back to you. I'm always amazed at, at speakers who, who, who take so much data and organizations to get so much data and track all these things that are happening in social protection around the world. Uh, just incredible. Anyways, thank you, uh, Georgia. A wonderful presentation. Um, I hope people could uh, take it all in <laughs> because there was a lot of information, but very good. Um, I'm going to open the floor now to, um, to the audience for questions for our first two speakers. And um, I... You know, I, I hope there's someone in the room who's brave enough to start us off, because it's usually just getting the first person to come up. That's, that's the hardest part. Um, and um, you can uh, direct your questions at either speaker or both speakers. And uh, if you do come up, please uh, indicate uh, who you are and, you know, are you from the bank or are you not from the bank um, and so on. So. Anyways, I, th I think I saw a hand up, and I think a, a gentleman there in, in the uh, fourth row or so is, is going to um, give us the first much question. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I am Baburam from Nepal, and I have a question and some of one experience from Nepal regarding the cost of living growth and the inflation targeting over there. First question is that, what was the reason that you have shown in the 
graph that evolution of the real and minimum wages seems in a platform approach, step by step. Uh, for the first speaker, uh, I am asking on what, why it was a step by step major regarding the real and minimum wage uh, seems to grow in platform approach. That is my question. In our experience after COVID-19, uh, we experienced a kind of double trap uh, on growth on site, uh, inflation, and the well-being of the people uh, on the other side. We experienced after COVID-19 pandemic, growth and recovery was quite good and encouraging. Uh, after some time, inflation started to grow, and the central bank opted for a tight monetary policy. Then growth dampened. Consequently, employment gone down. Again, a burden of the social protection erupted. So from your experience in your region, uh, what can be the certain uh, trade-off between these approaches? Our experience is that there should be certain level of balanced approach on policies. So if we focus on one side of the policies, for example, the uh, inflation, containing inflation at that point, growth, erupt, uh, growth dampens, and at that point, again, the well-being of the people goes down. Uh, so our experience is that uh, we need to have the certain level of balanced uh, approach. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. A couple of interesting questions there. Uh, Herwig, do you want to tackle them? Absolutely. Yes, lots of questions there. Uh, I mean, uh, as you said, and I think as I tried to show there, when there's high inflation, there are many moving parts. So adjusting policies becomes very, very uh, difficult. Prices change very differently for different goods. Some people are more affected than others. Labor market developments are, are, are very relevant, and that's the reason why I've shown the uh, minimum wage development uh, in particular. You, you notice that, uh, well, there are many steps, you know, going upwards uh, in terms of uh, nominal uh, minimum wages. Um, actually, um, this is the average uh, across OECD countries. So for individual countries, the, uh, the adjustments are very infrequent. Um, there are only very few examples, I think Netherlands is one of them, uh, where they have sort of a, you know, a threshold mechanism that w whenever uh, minimum wages the real value uh, declines uh, you know, more than a certain percentage, then there's sort of an automatic trigger of an adjustment. Uh, but that's, that's the exception. Uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, balancing these adjustments uh, and, and kind of connecting all these, these different parts, um, I think in order to have timely policy responses, you need some sort of uh, automaticity built in. But I don't think you can leave the entire response to automatic uh, algorithms. There's, there's, there's many uh, trade-offs and there's some sort of balancing act uh, to be made. And I think there's interesting examples actually uh, on the part of minimum wages because um, in, a, in, 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 a, in a lot and actually a growing number of uh, OECD countries, um, there are independent or semi-independent commissions, partly including uh, experts, but also social partners, etc., who look regularly at what uh, the, the labor market can take, if you like, in terms of uh, minimum uh, wage uh, increases. Um, now, in the recent you know, post-pandemic uh, um, period, actually, OECD countries were quite lucky in the sense that labor markets were very strong. Um, so they had not a problem of unemployment, but of labor shortages. Uh, and so I think that's one reason why these minimum wage adjustments uh, were, were, were possible. But I think it's also interesting to maybe learn from this um, institutional setup for minimum wages for other government programs. Could we envisage something uh, for, for benefits, for instance, to, uh, in, in order to, to adjust benefits, in order to avoid a situation where you have, you know, as Georgina uh, showed, so many uh, new programs? Could we actually achieve more with adapting uh, existing programs? Uh, and can we, can we pool different uh, insights and expert opinions in order to do this in a timely way? and in order to do this in a way that uh, uh, doesn't bring the entire social protection system out of balance. Thank you. 
Uh, Georgina, you want to respond to that, or do, do you think Herwig did a very good job of providing the response? Yes, yes, yes. Can you can you can you hear me fine? Yeah. We can. Yeah. No, I I agree that there there has to be so in the indexation search that we that, that we're conducting at the bank. We're also trying to you know to to make a full assessment of you know. How, how can we, in our case, how can we make social safety nets more resilient and more inflation proof, given the context in which in which this the, these programs operate? So um, I think that there there has to be a sort of uh, understanding of what are the ad hoc procedures, um, as well as you know what what can we learn from from countries that have already in place some sort of automatic um, indexation adjustments or automatic adjustments more more generally um, so I think our work is also um, trying to to look more to look more into that okay thank you I don't, I don't think either of them addressed your question about how to balance growth and inflation uh, but I think that's a question that the governments and macroeconomic policymakers to try to deal with all the time, right? They're trying to find that balance, <laughs> making sure inflation doesn't get out of, of hand. I'm not sure there's a, a magic figure, but I'm, I'm just too much of a microeconomist to give you a response on that one. A anyways, other questions in the room? Come on, he, 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 our, our friend from Nepal got us started, so he, he, he reduced the, you know, the, the first mover problem. Any other questions? I, I have two questions. Here we go. I, I found it interesting that although there are these, um, you know, indexing or these automatic adjustments, I was a bit surprised that it wasn't across the board adjustments. Why, why didn't? Why doesn't everyone have an adjustment? Because we know inflation. Is it partly because um, I don't know? Inflation has been relatively low for a fair amount of time. Is that it? Or I don't know. What's the reason? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think politics plays a big role in this. Uh, so uh, uh, not adjusting um, social programs, but also things like, uh, uh, like, like tax systems uh, creates additional fiscal space uh, for governments. Uh, now that can be um, relatively opaque and difficult to follow when inflation is low, which it has been, um, but it becomes a, a big and sudden problem when inflation picks up. Uh, as it has done. Uh, and so I think that's why more and more countries are, ha have, have actually raised to um, you know, partly look back at the experience of the, uh, you know, of, the, of the late 70s and 1980s when inflation was high uh, and some of these indexing discussions uh, took place. Uh, and I think there are some, there's some interesting examples of, uh, of, of countries' policies in, in that respect. So for instance, uh, Austria, uh, the country where, where I am from, um, uh, for, for for reasons of uh, the, the instability that they had back, you know, before the the, 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 the Second World War, there was always a huge aversion against uh, actually automatic indexing uh, there to, to avoid wage uh, sort of yeah. price uh, spirals. Um, but they've tackled this now in a way that uh, for um, for some benefits, but also for um, for the income tax system, uh, where there is some, uh, wh where there is a uh, an automatic adjustment every year of the the tax bracket, so people don't pay more even though they don't earn more in real terms, uh, but they haven't done a full adjustment. So they've done, I think, like two thirds of inflation, uh, and the the last third uh, part of the law is that that also has to feed into adjustment somehow, but it's up to the government to decide how. So they can still decide to um, support certain groups uh, more than others. So I think that's an, that's an interesting uh, sort of squaring the circle of, of, uh, of, of politics and the real experience of, uh, uh, of, of people in need. Okay, good. Uh, Georgina, uh, Georgia, I, I just wanna ask you one question because you made a, a, a constant distinction between subsidies and social assistance and you said, well, the one is still high but the other one is catching up and so on. Uh, do, do you have a perspective or should there be a perspective on what is better? I mean, is, is it better to have subsidies or social assistance or you can't really say that? They do different things and they're, they're focused on different things.
I think she didn't like my question. <laughs> oh, she's reconnecting now. She's, she's taking some time to think. Are you there? She, she can't hear us. She doesn't want to hear us. <laughs> yes, can I get a few? We have to move on, but yeah, if you want to try to pick that up. Just quickly, because that's something I, I also thought of, because there's this big contrast, I think, uh, partly in, in, the, in the response in terms of spending levels, but also the composition across uh, uh, lower and middle-income countries and, and high-income high countries. But there's some commonalities, also a big reliance on subsidies, right? And the question is, why is that? We know that this is uh, incredibly expensive. Uh, countries can ill afford that, uh, I think, in all parts of, uh, of the world. So why is it? Uh, I, and I think um, it would be interesting to see, and uh, Georgina can tell us more, uh, there's probably a bigger part of uh, uh, the, th that pattern of a lot of subsidies in, uh, in lower income and middle income countries is, is, is also a matter of the capacity of existing social protection systems so that they, it's just very hard to adjust very quickly. I think in high income countries, they can adjust that. Um, but I think the, the politics were such, partly also after COVID, where people sort of developed an expectation that everybody gets compensated somehow um, to have these broad uh, programs rolled out that are indeed very costly. But uh, So I think the pattern is similar, but I think the reasons are probably different. <laughs> okay. Uh, Georgia, are you here with us? I saw her, but then she slipped away. Okay, I think what we're going to do is, uh, thank you, Eric, for, for stepping in on that question. I think we're going to move to our next uh, two presenters now. And we are very happy to have with us, um, again, representatives from the region who can really tell us about what's happening in Asia. First of all, there's Ari Wibowo with Jacksono, which I, I think I did a very good job of pronouncing. Um, he's with the Directorate of Poverty Alleviation and Community uh, Empowerment. He's with, uh, and that's part of BAPINAS, which is the national, uh, the ministry, the national or planning okay. agency or ministry. Um, so I'll, I'll, to you now, if you want to come here, um, feel free to do so. Yeah, hello, good morning everyone. Good afternoon everyone. Welcome to my presentation. Uh, I'm Ari, first planner from National Development Planning Agency or BAPANAS. I work at Directorate of Poverty, Elevation, and Empowerment Community. Before I start the presentation, I want to say thank you to ADB Philippines in organizing this event. I would also like to greet our moderator, uh, our distinguished moderator, Professor Paul, uh, our speaker, Mr. Herrick, Mrs. Uh, Georgia, and Mrs. Panada, and all the participants. And today I'm going to share to you our experience of managing the food uh, assistance program or Sembako program. Uh, the main objective of this uh, social protection program in our country is uh, to elevation poverty and to support the people pursuing power targeting poor and vulnerable groups. Uh, okay, uh, next slide please. Yeah, next slide. Okay. As seen on the screen, uh, Indonesia average inflation is at 4.24%, uh, and in August, uh, we got uh, at 3.27%. Uh, and the characteristic of uh, inflation in Indonesia are very unique, uh, considering Indonesia geographical condition as an archipelago country. Uh, the inflation in Indonesia mainly influenced uh, by the supply side, especially related to the disruption in production, distribution, and government policies. And in the general, uh, the, the strategies adopted to control uh, our inflation are uh, price affordability, supply affordability, smooth distribution, and uh, effective communication. In terms of uh, price affordability strategy, uh, this food assistance program also make a contribution to maintaining inflation indirectly in Indonesia. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, in implementing poverty elevation, we have uh, several programs that are targeted to the extreme poor, poor and vulnerable groups. Uh, among them are conditional transfer or uh, flagship program, uh, we call uh, PKH, uh, and then uh, food assistance or sembako. 
education assistant, health assistant, and energy. The Sembako program, which became uh, the main focus in uh, my presentation, was based on pre presidential decree about non-cash social assistance. And there are several main concepts in this uh, program, which are social assistance and subsidies are distributed by uh, non-cash channel or by card via banking system. And then integration of multiple social assistance program on one card. And the main objective of program Sembako or uh, this poverty system program is to accelerate poverty reduction and improve financial inclusion. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the how we get the transformation from Lastra to Sembako program. The Sembako program is a transformation of the previous program named uh, Lastra or Rice for Welfare. The rice is a uh, medium quality and the weight is uh, 10 till 15 kilograms per family per month drop regularly at specific times. Furthermore, to improve the distrib uh, distribution operational process, distribution efficiency, and maintain the quality of food, so we improve the food assistance program process to be like on the right side. Uh, our food program today is a transformation of the rastra with a change in the distribution mechanism, which is no longer in the form of rice but uh, become cash that are distributed directly to the account of a beneficiary's family. And this money must be spent on the food needs uh, for eggs, rice, uh, protein, or veg vegetables or fruit, which can be obtained at a local market or designated agent. agent. And this uh, transformation process, we uh, involve uh, our banks our uh, all not state bank. Next slide, please. And uh, in this uh, picture shows, in Indonesia, 65% uh, spending is used for uh, food consumption, cut consumption, and then around 29% uh, uh, around, around of that consumption is for rice. So this program, Sembako Transformation, has a purpose for uh, helping the poor and vulnerable cover their food uh, expense, improving uh, beneficiaries' access to, uh, to and decision power of uh, more balance and variety of nutrition source, time and place disbursement or purchase, also improving financial inclusion, local economic activity, and program effect effectiveness and efficiency and last, supporting the SDGs achievement. And about the details from this program, uh, this uh, Sembako program uh, has the following key details. Families uh, at the lowest 25% are eligible, and then a mother or female in family disburse the benefit. The benefit amount is around $14.3 per month per family. This is by swiping a card at food vendor, we call uh, the bank agent uh, Iwarung. And then the beneficiaries can uh, buy staple food like uh, rice, corn, and uh, also a vitamin source like a fruit and uh, vegetable. And next, next slide, please. Yeah, and then what happened uh, in the pandemic period and uh, what uh, Indonesia response. Uh, COVID gives significant impact on the, our national medium term development plan and also the SDGs. Uh, Indonesia achieved one digit poverty in 2018. In September, in September 2019, uh, our poverty rate reached the lowest point at 9.22%. Uh, but in 2020, 2020 until 2021, the COVID has resulted in an increase in uh, our poverty rate and doing about uh, three years of work in elevating uh, the poverty. So there is a socioeconomic uh, status from uh, poor to chronic poverty, and it creates uh, new poor groups. The biggest decrease is uh, those who fall from vulnerable groups to poor groups, which is 47%, and poor groups, which goes down to chronic uh, poor groups, which is 55%. And at, you, uh, you can see in the below, uh, this is uh, some of the group that uh, need attention for the government. The elderly who live alone and household with elderly or disabled uh, household head and informal worker, 
household with a poor female head and pregnant woman, uh, isolated indigenous group, and socially uh, vulnerable groups. Next slide, please. So, uh, as a response to facing the uh, COVID outbreak, starting from uh, March 2020, uh, the, the benefit index uh, for Sembako program, which uh, was previously uh, 150,000 per family per month, changed to uh, 200,000 uh, rupiah per family per month, and the number of beneficiary was uh, increased from uh, around 15.6 million to 18.8 million beneficiaries. And the value uh, of the uh, our index is increased around 30%. So we uh, extend the, our existing or regular program in terms of coverage and benefit level. <coughs> Nothing changed in, uh, in terms of delivery mechanism. And uh, we also create a new program such as uh, fillet cash transfer, with subsidy or pre-employment pre card. Uh, the, the impact is that we can uh, manage to prevent further increase of uh, our poverty. The poverty rate now is uh, going down. Started from uh, September 2021, uh, the, the poverty rate uh, went back to one digit, uh, but not yet achieved our uh, lowest point. And in March 2023, the poverty rate was 9.36% uh, percent compared to 10.19% in 2020. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, that's uh, the end of my slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ari, for, for giving us an idea about food and, and support in Indonesia. I'm going to call on my next speaker right now. Her name is Supanda Loachai. I think I got that right. She's a, a policy and plan analyst and expert on income improvement and income redistribution, uh, social data-based and indicator development office of the uh, National Planning Council, the National Economic and Social Development Council in Thailand. Please, please come up and share your views. Right, thank you, Paul. And I also like to thank ATB for inviting me and <laughs> Thailand to be part of this um, session. Um, so for my presentation, um, for the first slide, please, um, the other one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, the outline is that I'm going to be just give you an idea of the ov overview of the social protection of um, a system in Thailand, and then just a little bit of inflation, and then I'll go on into the social protection responses to inflation that Thailand did over um, 2022, and. Then I'll talk a little bit about um, the directions where Thailand would like to go from here. So for the next slide, yes. <laughs> so for for social protection overview of Thailand, basically Thailand has a very broad base, um, high coverage of social protection at the moment. Um, in Thailand right now, um, the share of population covered by at least one scheme not uh, not not counting the the health coverage is already like uh, f uh, sixty eight percent, and with the health coverage that goes to ninety nine point six percent last year, and so um, but the problem is that uh, with the broad based coverage we still have a very sort of still very thin benefits. Um, the recipients for each of the programs um, get a relatively small amount compared to the poverty line, so that the amount of, of the assistance or of the social protection schemes are not enough to lift them out of poverty. And also in terms of uh, spending per GDP, uh, Thailand's uh, spending 
is still a bit low compared to its peers. Right now, the spending is about 3%, but while Vietnam and Malaysia is above 4%, and China is, I think, 7.2%. Um, also, um, right now, we have several um, universal schemes uh, with uh, 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 we were starting to introduce um, poverty targeted programs uh, starting in 2015, and that's um, uh, starting off with the child support grant. And we also have uh, education equity fund, which you know grants to uh, students in poor household households, and also. We also have state welfare cards, which gives you know several types of benefits to uh, low-income um, persons in Thailand, and um, also you know similar to the case of Indonesia, and I think also with uh, uh, Georgia has mentioned is that you know after the COVID, it has. Uh, the 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 social protection has expanded massively in Thailand as well, and 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 along with that, you know, because of the lockdowns and all that, um, the online registration and the use of electronic payment system has expanded drastically, and that that also happened in Thailand as well. In terms of inflation, um, you can see from the graph here that Thailand has was able to manage the inflation, the, uh, the, the core inflation, to be within uh, the, the, the country's target of 3%, you know, for a very long time, you know, around, like, actually about a decade or so. And then, and then just, just like everybody else in, in, in the world, you know, in, in 2022, it has gone way beyond the targets. And because of that, um, the government has rolled out quite a lot of the measures to tackle this high inflation. Uh, next slide, please. So, so basically, this is a bit small, I'm sorry. But, <laughs> but these are basically our, um, the, the, the Thai government responses to inflation. I kind of groups it into uh, schemes, but, but, but when the government rolled it out, it, it came out. The, the major one is the 10 measures to counter the, 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 the high inflations. And that includes um, two supports, like uh, 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 two, two transfer like income uh, discounts um, to, to the state welfare card holders um, to, to pay for the, the, uh, the fuel price, the higher fuel prices. And uh, the Social Security Fund um, monthly contribution reduction, uh, uh, you know, so, so, so that the members don't have to pay as much as they used to pay regularly. And then there are also, you know, like fuel subsidies, um, both the overall fuel subsidies as well as some of the programs that are targeting to, targeted to like taxi drivers, um, you know, honkers and street vendors, uh, as well as um, uh, some uh, motorcycle riders. And then the, uh, there are also um, minimum wage uh, increase, also to tackle the, the, the higher the, the higher inflation, and the, the last some of the other measures are sort of economic stimulus policies, um, which are you know the the um, travel tr tourism promotion scheme as well as um, some of the um, uh, meetings and conference um, tax incentives. So basically, those are, are all the, the responses that had been put in place last year. And for um, going forward, um, the next slide, please. Uh, going forward in terms of, of, of policy direction, 
uh, for social protection in Thailand is, you know, first of all, the integration of social protection system. Thailand is currently having a, a, a system is is frag fragmented. It, it's kind of in silos um, format, and so there are a lot of overlapping uh, benefits, and there are also gaps to some of the the, the groups that, that don't receive any of, of the be benefits. So we're trying to integrate the whole system and looking at it in, in a more efficient way and trying to cover everybody. Uh, and also uh, to the other one is to promote more co-payment system. We just recently um, finished you know, compiling the social budgeting uh, data which sort of look at the, the revenues and expenditure of uh, entire social protection systems in Thailand. And it turned out that currently 90% uh, of social protection programs in Thailand are non-contributory. And with the very rapid aging process in Thailand, it, it, we sort of project into the, the next um, 20 years, and, 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 and we see the, um, uh, a, a, a big, uh, you know, the, the, the big burdens that, 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 that we are facing in the near future. And so where we um, coming, um, a policy implication from that is, is you know, maybe we should um, start to do more of the co-payment system, but, but still you obviously need a non-contributory system, but maybe a little bit uh, a better mixing of, <laughs> of those. And lastly, obviously, is the shock responsive social protection, you know, with the highly impacted by um, climate change in Thailand and also the changing nature of work and the large informal sector in Thailand, you know, it sort of calls for um, more flexible social protection system as well as, you know, um, indexation of, 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 of the system as well. Uh, uh, indexation of the benefit, of course. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what we, we, we are trying to do um, going forward. And that's the end of my slides and presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That, that was very interesting. Uh, some of the things you got to at the end, which I, I thought were interesting, some of the things that here we talked about rationalizing the program, making it all make sense. You know, you you talked about that. You're working on it. Uh, the large coverage, but the the thinness of benefits. So it's interesting to see a lot of programs in place, a lot of efforts being made. But uh, we we've got to make the system work better. I think that's part of what you're saying. So I think afterwards you have a coffee with Harrowig. He's going to give you a lot of ideas. So. Anyways, we've got a couple of minutes left. If, if we've got questions, we've got a question over there. Please go ahead. You can come up to the mic if you want, or they can give you a microphone. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Yadi. I'm from uh, Ministry of Social Affairs of Indonesia. Uh, one question I addressed to Miss from Thailand. Uh, I heard from you that there are many respond from your government to to respond your uh, inflation uh, problem. Uh, I interest about the integration of data through single national national ID. I want to know how your government to manage the data to make sure the uh, the social assistance or uh, social protection can uh, take the poor, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the proper uh, uh, people. Thank you. If you. If you take the microphone there. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you for your question as well. Um, for for Thailand, I think uh, starting in, you know, even prior to the COVID, we have the state welfare card, which um, uh, register people, um, you know, open for people to come in and register themselves. Um, 
as 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 low income people and they have um they have a lot of criteria that you have to meet in order to be considered a, a card holder and uh and and for that there there are a system of you know <coughs> verification whether you are really a low income person you know we check with the with whether you have a credit card whether you have a a, a uh, you ha have a, a big piece of land, and then this disqualifies you. Uh, and so, uh, so, so we had that already in place. And then in COVID, we did the same thing, which is we register people online. So if you want to receive um, benefits, you have to show yourself. You have to register. And, and then there are, uh, there are certain um, verifications or certain criteria that you have to meet in order for you to 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 get the um, the benefits or, or the transfers um, what I didn't mention <laughs> but but is the, the the limitation that we are facing and it's kind of the challenge is that um, with that we were able to help a lot of people but there are still um, a big exclusion of about at least 30 percent of, of the people that we supposed to, you know, the, the very poor and the ones that are really need these assistance, but they are not able to access, you know, like online equipment or whatever, and they just being excluded from that. And, and that's, um, that's what we're trying to fix as well by, you know, um, getting another uh, mechanism of having people at the local area going down to find the very poor and sort of register them in order for them to um, get like government assistance and so Making sure the people who need it get it and the people who don't need it don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like that. Um, do we have any other questions? I think we're sort of at the limit. Yes, we have a couple. Please um, get a find. Uh, Give these people a microphone, or maybe they can come up. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is uh, Christian. I'm in Mexico, and I want to go to the United States. So I just have a quick one. It's not so much a question, but for example, the con many of the countries here are working with DACA, and it's very important to me. And there are enough health centers to come to know about IMF, shall I start from the beginning again? Rathi Palakrishnan, WFP, the World Food Program in Pakistan. Um, I think many countries who are attending this week's uh, conference work with the IMF. And be coming from Pakistan, I mean, I'm Singaporean, but I work in Pakistan, often a lot of the conditions the IMF places is to remove subsidies. Um, and it comes at a time where the countries don't have fully functional social protection programs or dynamic ones that can adjust, adjust very quickly. So in the end, what we're finding is the poor, once again, are disproportionately hit. And I just wondered if you could comment on that in, you know, in your own discussions at the bank level um, with, with the IMF. Thank you. Is that a question for me? I, I have to be careful what I say, right? Because uh, we, you know, if if I understand correctly, um, we we are somewhat different from the World Bank to some extent. Is that I, I don't think we we um, we advise so much on macroeconomic policy like the IMF does. Uh, so I don't think we're we're there uh, so much. Um, subsidies are very controversial, of course, because a lot of countries use them. Uh, there are international agencies like the IMF who don't like them, uh, often because they think they're distortionary and so on, um, and they use up a lot of funding. But I, I don't think I'm going to go farther than that. But thank you for your comment. I think that's something we, we always need to te keep into, in mind uh, when international agencies go to countries. <coughs> what are they doing? Are they af affecting a balance in the country that, that I is difficult? I think I saw another hand up. Yeah, is, is there coffee after this so we can go a few minutes, right? I'm, I'm taking you away from your coffee break, but uh, you can go and get your coffee if you need it. But uh, 
I, I'd like to hear these final questions. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Angina. I work for DFAT Australia. Maybe for Ms. Supanada, maybe just like quick questions. Um, it's very interesting when you uh, share with us like how the government of Thailand like increased a lot during the inflation to top up the existing social protection budget. I think we understand from the you know uh, learning from the COVID inflation. Uh, usually, when the social protection budget was below the comparably uh, lower to the other neighboring countries, but then emergency happened. The government actually able to top it up uh, to a standard uh, a percentage. Like in the Thailand um, experience, uh, I know you mentioned earlier it was only like three percent, but during that inflation, was it actually reached above four to five percent uh, for the total the social protection budget? Um, and for maybe on top of that, um, the beneficiary is coming to uh, follow up question to the Payadi earlier from the Mosa. Uh, for the beneficiary, uh, are you considering? Um, the, the, the assistance that was given, was it only for the existing beneficiary or uh, within this short period of time you were able to collect data for the new poor and new vulnerable? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. You, you, you were very right <laughs> on, on the, the expenditure to GDP. Um, uh, um, during, um, during the COVID and then, you know, last year, um, the, the percentage did actually went up to about 5%, but, but that was also because um, the government also, you know, um, borrowed of about um, 2 trillion baht or something. To 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 um, to spend on the 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 um, COVID relief measures and all that, so that's that's why the the percentage per GDP went up, and but but I think it's it's probably coming down. Like I, s I saw the the, the, the numbers and it <laughs> it so, sort of went back down a little bit um, after the COVID, and um, for the other questions. Um, um the the programs the 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 inflation um reduction uh, the 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 counter inflation measures um we did both <laughs> we actually you know top up to the 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 welfare card holders who who are already there um they they already hold the the the, the cards and we also uh, had some of the programs that, you know, um, open for n for new registration um, rounds or whatever, and so um, and and so for that we were able to include more people. But but um, I think for for last year for the inflation, we targeted you know like taxi drivers, so we registered them, and then um, motorcycle riders, and 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 so we we got those people. But for the poor, I think it was only the the state welfare card holders. But that's already about fourteen million. It's 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 much more than just the poor. It's the low income people. And um, for that, we didn't update the. It it it, it isn't you know like dynamic. Like we we don't update them every year, but we update in about a couple of years. And then we, we, we open for the new round of registration. And for this new round, we already asked for their consent to, to, to update their income every year. And so that, that um, if their income has gone beyond the, 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 the threshold, then they would be um, out of the program. But, but, but we have to see how it works because we just... Um, uh, implemented. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to I'm going to stop it now because um, well, you need your coffee and your break. Um, I just want to thank our four speakers. I don't know if uh, Georgia is still with us, but um, our th other three, three speakers. I think they've done an excellent job um, presenting, answering some of your questions. Can we give them a round of applause, please? Okay. We're done.
Enjoy your coffee. <laughs>